Well, good morning, friends. Ah, that was a good song to end with. It's good to know. It's good to be reminded that we have victory in Jesus. I don't know about you, but uh, I've been troubled quite a bit this week, just with a lot of things, uh, just thinking about our our culture, our society. Um, it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on, but I don't know, this, the elections of this week weighed heavily on me, um, knowing that there have been states that codified the killing of our children. That broke my heart that even within our own community, that there are people who are waging war against us for upholding the biblical view of what a man and a woman is, and people attacking others because they have the audacity to say that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. And there's just so much that I long for in terms of seeing that victory present here and now, yet knowing that we won't fully experience that until uh, until Jesus comes back. So I thank you, God, that we have the victory in Jesus. So oh, can you pray with me? I just feel the need that we need to take some time remember who he is and who we are um, yeah. in light of everything going on around us just to focus our attention on him so, so pray with me our great God and heavenly father It's a good reminder that in you, that your name does bring victory. Yet we are reminded time and time again that we live in a broken world. That there are things going on around us that we don't understand, that we don't like that are not in line with your design and with your purposes. And it breaks our hearts. And sometimes it leaves us feeling not knowing what to do, not knowing how to respond, sometimes feeling that there is no victory and that there is no hope. But we know that our hope is in you. Our hope is not in our government. Our hope is not in the people that lead us. Our hope is not in our culture, our community, our services. It's not even in this room, in this church. Our hope is in you. And God, we come to you now, I come to you now, asking for forgiveness, how we as a country have turned our backs on you, even how I as an individual at times have turned my back on you to pursue my own interests, my own desires, to live life in my way as I choose to define it. in your word we're reminded that in many ways the problem is, is us it's those who claim to be yours your word says if your people who are called by your name would turn from their wicked ways and seek your face if you will, if you will come down from heaven you will hear our prayers and you will heal and heal our land Lord, often we don't. We don't turn away ourselves. We can 
who we are in the past that we choose to do. So forgive us. Forgive me. May we as a people turn our eyes to you in all things. And we see you as our hope, as our future. And we ask you that that you would fight our battles for us, that you would go out in front of us, that you would change hearts, that, that we as your people would come alongside and that we would speak your message and speak your truth about Jesus. He is the only one who can change hearts and the only one who will bring you victory. So now, God, even as we open up your word, as we hear what you have to say to us today, um, God, speak to us. May your spirit convict us in the ways that, I don't know, sometimes we often want to suppress, in the ways that we often think that we don't need to hear what you have to say. But your word is is powerful. It, It cuts below the surface exposes us for who we are and what we need in you. So use your word today to make us more like Jesus in all we do, in all we say, in all we think. Great God, we do we <laughs> do look forward for your, your kingdom to come. And until then, God, make us like your son. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, um, please go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at the last five verses of that chapter today. Uh, We're continuing on in our our series on the book of Romans. And, um, you know, these five verses, we're finally getting to, you know, we we got to some good news couple weeks ago, uh, once we got into 3, verse 21, uh, and we're going to continue on to a little bit of that good news today, but, um, you know, just in general, we all like, or at least we all have things that we tend to brag about, right? You know, every grandparent in the room likes to brag about their grandkids, so, you know, they're quick to pull out a wallet full of photos. Or in my mom's case, uh, an entire three or four bookshelves worth of photos to brag about her grandkids. Um, You know, social media, we we like to brag about our cats for some reason. I don't know, but there's a lot of that on social media. But everybody likes to talk about their animals and their pets. You know, I have already heard in this room this morning some people bragging about their 10-0 team versus another 10-0 team. Y'all know which side I lean on, but, uh, but well, we'll find out in two weeks. Uh, but <laughs> as Americans, even in spite of what's going on with our country and our elections, we are proud of our American heritage. And for some of us, you know, I like talking about my Italian-American heritage. I know Ruffner doesn't sound Italian. It's not, but there's a lot more Italian on my side than than that, but, you know, and, and I, I often hear in our testimonies, both sometimes as a, as a proud thing, sometimes as a thing that just points to the reality of our situations, but we talk about how we grew up in Christian homes, or we talk about how we might have gone to a Christian school, or, or our education be a certain way, or we talk about how we have decent and good behavior that we're not as bad as the other guy. You know, like we, we are proud of certain things. Sometimes misdirected. A lot of times misdirected. But when it comes to Jesus, there is no room for pride. We all come to the cross humbly. There at the foot of the cross, it's been said that the ground is level, that we all come equal. And 
And as we've looked at in Romans already, we all come equally guilty. So there's no place for pride when it comes to our faith. And yet, even in knowing that, and even in knowing that it's not because of things that we've done, there are still things that we tend to grab at to think that somehow that earns us a little bit of favor or, or placement with God. And so that's what we're going to look at t- today is really that's what those last five verses of chapter three are about. Um, is what faith is. Uh, so the, the, the title of our sermon today, I, I, I called it Faith Alone. The elders earlier this week gave me a hard time with that title. You know, it's you know, the most unique title ever given to any sermon ever since the Reformation, you know. Faith Alone. Yeah, I really thought long and hard about that one. But um, but that really is what our faith is all about. Our, our, our whole belief system is about having faith in Jesus and that alone, nothing else. But in order to understand that, you need to have a little bit of context of what this is. And, you know, I, I've been told that been reminded that I often like to give context before I preach and been told sometimes by my family that I spend too much time in the context. So today it's going to be a pretty brief uh, review of where how we got to this point. So you have some notes that you can fill in and there's some blanks in there. Um, but the early part of uh, the book of Romans it really is that the gospel brings salvation to all who believe. In, in, in Romans 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul talks about he, that he's not ashamed of this gospel, that it, it brings salvation to everyone who believes, and that that gospel reveals the righteousness of God. But then he goes on to say that we need the righteousness of God because none of us, in and of ourselves, are righteous. Like, we need his righteousness because we are not. And then he takes a lot of chapter, end of chapter 1 and and all of chapter 2 to say that, obviously, the wicked are not righteous. You know, those wicked and godless Gentiles who do all those awful things are not righteous. Then, but not even the moral or the religious Jewish person is righteous as well. That we need his righteousness, because we are not. But then he goes on to say that, yeah, none of us are righteous, right? The, there's the Jew, the Gentile, they're not righteous. And any attempt on our part falls short. It's like we don't seek after God, but we try and do good things. But that's not going to be enough. And because of that, we all stand guilty before God. And so that's really the bad news. Those, those first couple chapters, bad news. Like, hey, guess what? We're bad people. Not just that we're bad people, but we are guilty people. And we'll never get it right in an, on our own. But that's where chapter 3, verses 21 through 26 is the good news. That God's righteousness is freely given to everyone through faith in Jesus. That it really is, it's, it's faith alone. That we cannot get righteousness on our own. Our righteousness falls short. It's, it's filthy rags. But he gives us his righteousness. And, and that's what brings us to where we are today in, in chapter 3, verses 27 through 31. But in 322, Paul brings up this key idea that the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. That faith is the only channel by which a person can be declared right in the eyes of God. That it's faith. And then what he does in in 327 and all the way through chapter 4 is he expands on that idea. That the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus to everyone who believes. 
And so he's expanding on this idea from, from this point where we are today, 327, all the way through chapter 4, which we're going to be talking about next week. It's through faith. It's through faith. It's through faith. So in our passage today, Paul is going to make a general argument about faith. And then in chapter 4, he's going to illustrate that point of what faith is, what it looks like, how it gets played out in it. So these five verses, at the end of chapter 3, are the facts. And chapter 4 is the example. It's the illustration. It's the example of how those facts are played out in the life of Abraham. And you'll see a lot of parallels between this passage and the passage next week. But here in 327a, it talks about that there's no boasting. And the same thing is done in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, how there's, where there's no boasting for Abraham. Today we're going to talk about being justified by faith and not works. And the next week we're going to hear how Abraham was justified by faith and not works. That, that the circumcised and the uncircumcised are under one faith, under one God. And in chapter 4 we're going to hear the same thing. It's one faith, one God. And so, these verses today are really going to be at the heart of what it means to have faith alone. So, if you wouldn't mind, please stand with me. And we're going to read these five verses together. At least follow along with me as I read them. Um, And then we'll just dive into this passage a little bit. So, all right, follow along with me. It says, where then is boasting? It is excluded. And on what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Do we then nullify the law by faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. All right, you may be seated. So faith is mentioned five times in these five verses. In fact, faith is the theme of the entire section from 327 all the way through chapter 4. Because faith is actually mentioned uh, in every paragraph of that section. There's faith versus the works of the law. There's faith versus works in general. There's faith versus uh, circumcision. There's faith over and above the law. There's faith versus sights. It's faith. It's faith. It's faith. So clearly, he's teaching this idea of faith alone. Um, some of us may know this as one of the five solas, the sola fide, uh, faith alone. So obviously, it's a, a pretty important part of what Paul is trying to get across. It's faith. Faith. The thing is, Paul really doesn't give a a pretty clear definition of what faith is in this section. Uh, The closest thing he gets to is just a a brief little part in in chapter 4 where he says that Abraham believed God and it was credited for righteousness. Um, But there's not really that the big, long theological treatise of what faith is. And so I'm going to attempt to define that just a little bit for us. Uh, Because I think there are three elements of faith that are pretty key to understanding uh, what this passage is about and and, uh, really what faith is. So the first thing is that faith, that that there is a positive element to it. Uh, As a kid, I was given this simple definition, and probably some of you have heard this too, that that faith is basically, it's it's believing without seeing, right? Right? 
But really, faith is, is belief or trust whether you see something or not. Like whether it's something that is seen or unseen, that there is an, a belief or a trust that goes into it. Uh, Pastor Van used uh, the example of, of a chair a couple weeks ago. Like, like we see the chair, we see how it's made, we, we kind of have an understanding of it. We have to have faith that it's going to hold us up when we choose to sit down in it. Um, uh, one of the, the Bible dictionaries said it's the, the spiritual perception that moves to action. Um, Charles Spurgeon put it this way, that, that faith is sanctified common sense. Um, that there, there, are, there are positive elements to it. There, there's a knowledge and there's a sense and then there's action. Uh, that kind of goes along with this idea of believing or trusting in something. That doesn't quite give us a full definition of what faith is. It's just an element of it. But there's also a negative element of it that helps broaden or, or fill out this idea of what faith is. But if faith, it's not about what we do. It's not about our effort. It's not about us, in a sense, putting our trust in something that we have done. Because our effort isn't good enough. It will never be good enough. Human effort is a trust in oneself. But faith says that my effort isn't going to be good enough. My effort's can never make me right in the eyes of God. And because it's not about myself, because it's not about what we do, that, it, that faith eliminates the pride of our human effort. And we're going to talk more about this in a minute because that really is a key part of what this section is about. Um, but faith has the, these two things. There's a positive side and there's a, this belief, there's this trust, there's this understanding that it's not about ourselves. But really what is a, 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 another key thing is that faith has an object. Like it's not just a blind faith. The object of our faith is the person and the work of Jesus Christ as it's revealed in the Bible. You see, it's not actually about how much faith we have. It's not how much trust or belief that we have. But it's really about the object of who or what we put our faith in. You know, using that example that Van had with the chairs, you know, we could have a really wonky, rickety chair. And we can look at it and say, yeah, that thing's not going to hold me up. But I'm not even going to bother trying to sit in it. Or we can look at one of these comfortable pink chairs and say, all right, that, that looks solidly made. I'm going to sit in that because I know it's going to hold me up. I, a long time ago, I remember trying to give this example in, in one of my sermons that, if I recall correctly, I completely botched. So I'm going to try it again. Um, but, I mean, think of it this way. Two people could be standing on a... Uh, a bridge over an icy lake. And it could be this scrawny little guy who's like, God, yeah, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump down on, onto the icy water and I'm going to skate across to the other side. Like, cause I got tons of faith that that's going to hold me. Except for the fact that that icy water is really only, you know, an eighth of an inch thick. And the moment he gets into it, he's going to fall right through it. But in another lake, there's this other guy who's, you know, Kind of a husky guy, maybe slightly overweight like myself. And he's like, you know, I don't know. I don't know if this lake's going to hold me. Because when I jump in it, I'm a big guy and I might fall through. But, you know, I really believe it. And the thing is, that lake is like 12 inches thick. And it doesn't matter how much he believes it or not, when he jumps onto that icy frozen over lake it's going to hold him and he's going to be able to skate through the other side in both cases there was faith one guy had a lot of faith but the object of his faith 
wasn't worth putting in. It was so thin that the object of his faith wasn't going to hold him so he can go across. But the other guy had a little bit of faith. But the object of his faith was a thick lake, thick piece of ice. And the object of his faith is what was able to get him to the other side. Our, the object of our faith is a historical, biblical Jesus who died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. The object of our faith is someone who we can put our trust in because we know that what he says he will do, what he has said he has done. And our faith may be little, or we may fully, fully embrace it with no doubts whatsoever. But if we are putting our faith in Jesus, that is a solid foundation, a solid faith to put in. Again, to say something from Spurgeon, which I know, I know you guys hear, me, I, I tend to quote Spurgeon a lot, but it's going to get worse over the next couple of times because my mom just bought me a book on, like, all the quotes of Charles Spurgeon. So I've been reading that almost like, well, not quite like the Bible, but pretty close. So anyway, um, Spurgeon says, My faith rests not upon what I am or shall be or feel or know, but my faith rests in what Christ is and what he has done and what he is now doing for me. Faith cannot hang upon itself. It must hang upon Christ. See, ours isn't a blind faith. It's not faith for faith's sake. Like, I just believe, and because I believe, you know, like some Disney thing, oh, it's just the power of belief. Our faith is directed toward a person. It's a trust in him. And it's a trust in him alone. It's that positive, negative, and the object all together. There's knowledge and there's a sense and there's action that kind of gets put into it. So, so that gives us a little bit of a, hopefully a little bit of a clearer picture of what faith is. And, um, but then... This passage that we just read tells us, like, when faith is present, that what that does is it eliminates room for other things. Like, if we have true biblical faith, then there are some things that just do not jive with that faith. So again, uh, you can fill in some spots in your notes, but now that we've fleshed that out a bit, what faith is... Let's look at what Paul says faith actually looks like. And so I, I do think that there are four things in this passage that the necessity of faith really should eliminate in our life. And the first one is pretty clear in verses 27 and 28, where it says, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. And on what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. And so the first thing is that righteousness by faith leaves no room for boasting. As we already said, it's, it's that negative aspect of faith. It's, it's not that, it's not about what we do. It's not about what we do. And so if it's not about what we do, then we have nothing to be proud of. There's nothing that we can brag about. Now, now let's remember in context who, who Paul's writing to. He's writing to uh, the Christians there in the church in Rome. But specifically, he's addressing the Jewish Christians, the, the ones who came to faith in Christ out of the Jewish faith. And as we already said in chapter 2, Paul makes it clear that, that it doesn't matter how moral they are. It doesn't matter 
that they have the law. It doesn't matter that they're, that they're God's special chosen people, that those aren't things to boast about. And specifically, like the Jewish people had some things that they wanted to boast about. Like, you know, their ethnicity was something that the Jewish people would have thought, yeah, that's, that's something that, that should help bring me into right standing with God. Right? You know, like, we're the Israelites. We're the Jews. We're God's chosen people. There's an assumption that, well, because God chose us, that must mean that we're in good standing with God, right? I mean, I mean think about it. The, the Israelites, you know, they had Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They had Joseph and Moses and David. But anyway, Paul's saying here, nope. Your ethnicity is not something that you could put your confidence in. Your ethnicity, you know, you're, you're in the same boat as all the Gentiles. You're still guilty before God. Well, if our ethnicity is not something that we can put our confidence in, what about our privileges? And we're going to get to this uh, later on in chapter 9, but... There are a lot of things that the Jewish people had as privileges as God's chosen people. Yeah, when we get to nine, there, there are like eight different ways that the Israelites were privileged above other, na- other nations. They had the covenants. They had the law. They had the temple. And those, that's just to name a few of them. But even those things were things that they couldn't boast about. As Paul said in chapter 2, their chosen nation status, the fact that they had the law given to them, those were acts of God's kindness toward them. Those things should have brought them to repentance. Those were God's kindnesses to them that should have led to repentance. But instead... Rather than saying, oh my gosh, I'm I'm humbled before God. Thank you, God, for this. I come to you. They're like, no, these are feathers that I could put in my cap. Like, we're special because we're chosen. We're special because we have the law. We don't need to worry about these other things because somehow we have these extra special things that other people don't have. So we have a better standing with God. I was like, nope. That's not the case. In fact, those things just prove that you're more guilty. You're just as guilty as all the rest. Those things became a higher value to the people than actually having a relationship with God himself. But if their ethnicity and their privileges weren't enough, like, if you couldn't boast on those things, well, maybe you can at least boast about your moral or religious achievements, right? Like, can I brag about the fact that, you know, I'm not as bad as that guy? Like, you know, you know and, you know, we do this sometimes, too. Like, <sighs> God must be happy that I'm on his team. Like, right? Like. He got me. I, I was never that bad. You know, I've never spent time in rehab. I've never done this. I went to a Christian school. God's lucky to have me. He's like, no. No. We can't put confidence in the fact that we're good people. We're not good people. It doesn't matter what you've done or what you haven't done. It doesn't matter if you come to church every Sunday, if you read your Bible, uh, read your Bible most of the time, or if you pray, or pray just when you have time, or 
some of us might say, well, you know, I, I don't swear, or swear that often. Well, maybe when I hit my thumb with a hammer, or if that person cuts me off in traffic, or if my spouse makes me really, really angry. You know, like, I'm not that bad, though, right? I, I have those excuses. Like we, like, we all think we're really good, and so we realize that we're really not. No, our religious achievements, our holier-than-thou type things are nothing to brag about. Those are not things that we can put our confidence in. Because well, they're, ju they're just not good enough. They fall short of God's standard. Well, we just can't boast about it because... A person is not made right by those things. A person is only made right by what Jesus did. And this is where Paul talks about this pretty clearly in other books as well. That you know, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he says, It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, and the emphasis here is mine, but it says, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. Or in Titus 3, verses 4 through 6, it says, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. We can't boast because it's not something we've done. And that really is the point of verses 27 and 28 here. Why can't we boast? Is, this, is it this rule that, some, what's the rule that keeps us from boasting? Is it the rule of the law? Like, no, it's not the rule of the law that keeps us from boasting. Because if it was the law, the law would, in some ways, allow us to boast. We could say, you know what? Hey, look at me. I kept 100% of the law. That person only kept 999 percent of the law so look what I've done like if it was just the law there would be room a little bit for boasting because if it depended upon us keeping it some of us could say we did it better than others we cannot boast because we are not supposed to boast because of the law it's the rule of faith that keeps us from boasting it's faith in what Jesus did. It's faith in his mercy. It's faith in his gift to us. He did it. It's all Jesus. You and I have nothing to do with it. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, if anyone boasts, well, he's quoting scripture, but he says, if anyone boasts, let him boast in the Lord. We can't say anything about ourselves. But if we're going to brag about something, someone, we should be bragging about Jesus and what he did. So, the first thing is that righteousness by faith leaves no room for boasting. The second thing is that righteousness by faith leaves no room for excluding others. Verse 29, is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Well, yes, so Gentiles too. You know, if God is the God over everyone, then, then who are we to not share God's truth and God's love with everyone? He is the God of his chosen people, and he's the God of us as well. God's heart from the very beginning has always been for the nations. So this is going to be my plug for the perspectives class. But you will learn this week after week after week. God's heart from the very beginning has been for everybody in his creation. But it's the, his, the nations. 
And I don't think Israel fully got this. But even when God called Abraham to, to be the father of the Israelite nation, to be the father of his chosen people, he says in Genesis 12, that I will bless you to make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It wasn't just for his family. It was for the entire family, the entire world. When Solomon dedicated the temple, it's so that all the peoples of earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no one else. All the peoples of the earth. In Isaiah 56, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Of course, we know it from the Great Commission in, in Matthew 28 and Acts 1 that, that we are called to go to the ends of the earth. And Acts 1.8 says that we may be as witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the remotest part of the earth. It's not just for one group of people, but it's for the entire world. Then, of course, this gets played out at the end of time in the world of Revelation. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Salvation to our God who sits on our throne and to the Lamb. For all tribes, all peoples. There, there's no room for excluding others. This faith isn't just our faith. We shouldn't be holding it in. We shouldn't somehow say, well, I'm, I, I mean, I've never heard this in this room, or anything, but, you know, this is an American thing or a Jewish thing or a Western thing. This is for all people. No one's to be excluded in this. The third thing in this is that in this section, I, I think there's a little bit of saying that righteousness by faith leaves no room for religious pluralism. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, so Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. The oneness of God was confessed every day by faithful and religious Jews. The Lord our God is one Lord. That's the Shema. That was their, their daily prayer. He is one Lord. The Lord of everyone. And if he wasn't the Lord of everyone, then there would be people without a God. And if he is everyone's true God, then the requirements are the same for everyone. You're not going to have different requirements for different people. You know, circumcision was a covenantal sign between God and his people. We certainly don't have time today to go into all the significant elements of, of circumcision. But obviously, it was a very physical and tangible sign between God and his people. But that visible sign was never meant to be considered apart from the, its inward reality. Like, it was meant to be a reflection of what was going on truly in a person's heart. So it's just like baptism. Like when Joy gets baptized soon, that's that baptism is intended to be an outward sign of her inward reality of faith. It's not her baptism that makes her special or saves her. It's what's going on inside. It's the inward reality. And those who are circumcised here are justified by faith. 
those who are not circumcised are justified by faith. The faith of both groups have the same positive aspects, the same negative aspects, or the same object. It's a trust in Jesus Christ and not anything or anyone else. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no room to say that Christianity is just one way to God. That you can find God through Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism. Those aren't other ways to God. There's one faith. If there's one God, then there's one way to get to him. He's not making paths through other religious things. So religious faith leaves no room for boasting, excluding others, pluralism. And the last thing I would say is there's no room for disobedience. Do we then nullify the law by faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Now, I'll say this. This verse is one that has probably raised a lot of questions with, with Bible scholars over the years. It's probably the most difficult one in this section to, to, to fully understand because it's, Paul's not 100% clear on his meaning. Um, you look at different commentaries and scholars, you'll see that there are different ways that people understand uh, what it means to uphold or establish the law, as some of our translations say. But the question is clear. Or if we're to live by faith, do we just throw away the law? Do we just get rid of it? Does it is it irrelevant to us now if we're living by faith? And Paul says, no, it's, it's not irrelevant. We don't nullify, we don't just get rid of it. without going into all the different ways that this could, could be understood. I will say this, that faith gives us the ability to do what the law requires. That by having faith, not that we're ever going to keep the law fully, Really, probably the best way of looking at this is that, the, that the, the law is fulfilled in and through our faith in Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the one who upholds and fulfills the law fully. But by putting our faith in Jesus, we have that ability to live according to faith so that we can do what the law requires. We can't just throw it out and say, ah, well, that doesn't apply to me anymore. I don't have to follow the Ten Commandments. Like, no. God still is a holy God. He still tells us how we should be living. How we are to direct our lives in such a way that is honoring to him. Like, the law still applies in that regard because it shows us what a righteous life looks like. Now, of course, we're not going to do that fully and completely. But we wouldn't be doing that on our own. It takes Jesus to help us live that out. So we don't toss out God's laws. A life of faith calls us to live a life of obedience. We don't just do our own thing. We don't just make up our own standards. We continue to follow Jesus and do what he calls us to do and live how he calls us to live. Even when our culture says, no, no a man can change his sexuality and by just by calling himself something different. A man can do whatever he wants because that's how he feels. Like, no, we still live according to God's design. So there's no room for disobedience in that. Well, let me wrap things up by this way. You know, I, I kind of 
joked a little bit earlier how the fellow pastors gave me a hard time for such a unique sermon title, right? And one thing that they said, well, if, you know, he's not going to come up with a unique title, then, you know, maybe, maybe I can come up with a, an, an acrostic to kind of fit faith alone. Because I actually like those. I, I like having acrostics or things like that to help me remember what the passage is about. But, you know, I've got five verses here. So what do you do with five verses to come up with an acrostic on faith or faith alone? Well, this is my attempt. Faith alone, it's fully accepting that it's totally his and leaning on nothing else. We are... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> we can't lean on anything else but Jesus. We try sometimes. We think it's ourselves. We think that we've done it all, that we can somehow have better standing with God if we live a certain way or do a certain thing, that somehow that will put us in a right relationship with God. But our right relationship with God comes only from him. Nothing else. You can't put your faith in your church. You can't put your faith in your good deeds. You can't put your faith in anything else but in Christ alone. And it's by faith alone that we are made right with God. So pray with me. Well, I thank you, <laughs> God, even as I go over this, that it is because of what you've done. Because my efforts fall short all the time. I screw up on a regular basis. But it's because of what you have done, God. God and for those who have never put their hope and their faith and their trust in you, for those who are trying to do it on their own, trying to earn their way to heaven by being good or resting in, in some form of religious effort, and may this be the day that they turn to you and say, it's all you, Jesus. So we praise you, God, and we thank you in the name of our Savior.